Whether this is true, or if the two girls were targeted by someone out in the woods, will potentially forever remain unknown. But wait, what if the tour guide had something to do with it? A lot of people believe Feliciano had something to do with their deaths. In fact, multiple women have left reviews on the tour guide, warning women not to go into the woods alone with him, as he can become very touchy-flirty. Oh shoot, hold on! Por qué? Por qué aquí? What? Uh, disturbing cases of people disappearing into the woods. In 1991, a 12 year old boy named Jared Negretti went hiking on a camping trip with his Boy Scout troop that consisted of 14 other boys. They were hiking towards the summit of Mount San Gorgonio in the San Bernardino National Forest in Southern California. Jared was on the shorter and heavier side. Around 6 p.m., 1,000 feet away from the summit, another group of hikers spotted Jared straggling behind and notified the scoutmaster at the summit. They said he was seen shortcutting the switchbacks on his way down the trail and was told not to and to stay on the trail. Man, Jared, bro, what is wrong with you, man? What you, man, this is, man, this is what happened. They, this is a movie move, bro. A movie move is that one guy in the group that want to explore, that that watch everybody and then look like, you know, like that part in the movie where <clears throat> you act like the person, that one character that looks off to the side or something and like see something, I guess, fascinating or something that they, that they might be curious about. And then they look over there. And then walk over there, and, and, and everybody walking straight forward, but they like walk, walk off to the side. That's Jared. Jared is being a dummy. He's like, oh, we can't go there? Why can't we go there? Let's see what's down there that we can't go see. He's going to find out what's waiting for him, bro. Trail by the other hikers. The scoutmaster, who was an experienced hiker, said he would pick up Jared on the way down. When he finally was able to descend the mountain to pick up Jared, he was nowhere to be seen. As soon as the scoutmaster realized that Jared had disappeared, he took the other scouts and his troop back to base camp and then hiked about five miles in the dark to get help. Sheriff's deputies, along with search and rescue teams, began searching a 130 square mile area of the San Gorgonio wilderness, a very rocky, tree-lined terrain. It's too big. Within three days, their search was focused on a six square mile area where a footprint believed to match one of Jared's high top tennis shoes was found. Searchers also discovered beef jerky and candy wrappers believed to have been dropped by Jared, and perhaps most importantly, his camera was found. On the film roll were 12 pictures. Most were landscapes taken by the boy when he was still with the troop, but the last one shows a self-portrait, in which it seems he pointed the camera at his face, aided with the flash of the camera. Oh, fudge! It's possible he lost the camera when he slid down a portion of the mountainside. At least 70 officers, including some airlifted by helicopter and some on horseback, were deployed. Some of the helicopters were even equipped with infrared scanning. Over the next two weeks, as many as 3,000 people had logged 45,000 hours searching 50 square miles of the San Bernardino National Forest. So the question is, did he fall off the trail and slip down the mountainside? While it's possible, it seems unlikely that his body wouldn't have been found in the immediate area around the switchbacks he was cutting down. Some people think he may have been the victim of a bear attack, but this seems unlikely as well, as there were no signs of blood, drag marks, or other evidence linked to any animal attack. Some believe he was abducted by a predator, given the mountain is well used by hikers. To this day, three decades later, Jared's remains have never been found. That is weird. On the cold night of Feb... That's weird, man. Jared has gone E. Coyote. 1978, five young men from Yuba County, California, Bill Sterling, Jack Hutes, Ted Weir, Jack Madruga, and Gary Mathias, headed to California State University to attend a basketball game. When the group of men didn't return the next day, friends and family grew concerned. What should have been a quick road trip to see a basketball game turned into a mystery that has never been solved. All five men suffered their own mild forms of mental issues, but they were still able to fully function in society. The men were scheduled to play in a Special That's Olympics that. basketball game of their own the next day, for which they prepared their clothes before leaving for California State University the day prior. 
A police search ensued shortly after they were reported missing, and a few days later, the men's car was found abandoned far from the route they should have taken to return to Yuba City. In fact, it was a whole hour in the wrong direction of Yuba City, having been driven up a winding mountain pass in the Plumas National Forest at the northern point of the Sierra Nevada. The car had a few empty food wrappers and drink bottles. Apart from that, the car was empty. The car was found in working condition. It was lodged in a snowbank with no signs of foul play. However, the car could have been easily pushed out by the five young men, raising more questions. For the next week or so, police and forest rangers searched the area hoping for any signs of them, but unfortunately any possible tracks of the men, or even God forbid their bodies, were covered by a passing snowstorm. Multiple sightings of the five young men were reported, but none led to their discovery. First, a man named Joseph Scones called police, saying he saw the group of men on the Friday they disappeared, while he was trying to push his stuck car out of the snow. Joseph suffered a mild heart attack while trying to push his car out, and Dang. when he saw flashlight beams outside his car and a small group of men, he tried to call and ask the men for help, but they suddenly disappeared as if they ignored him. A second witness said she saw five men in a red pickup truck on Saturday and Sunday, an hour from where the car was abandoned. She told police that two of the men came into her store to buy food and use the phone while the rest stayed in the truck. Their disappearances continued to baffle everybody, even more so when the snow melted months later, in June of that same year, because more questions arose. A local man noticed a broken window on a Forest Service trailer, and when police inspected it, they found the dead body of Ted Weir inside. He appeared to have died from starvation, despite having food readily available nearby in the trailer. He was wrapped in many layers of blankets, and his feet were badly frostbitten. But what Whoa. makes no sense is the fireplace, which could have been easily set up and could have kept him warm, was completely untouched. And on top of that, warm snow clothes that were found in the trailer were unused by Ted. It's possible he lived up to 13 weeks after the initial disappearance. 20 miles away from where the car had been abandoned, the bones of Bill Sterling, Jack Hutes, and Jack Madruga were found not far from Ted's amazing- Matthias! Hey, yo, Matthias, look! Matthias, is he a sus? Is Matthias sus? Matthias look like he wants some revenge. Y'all see his face, bro? Do y'all see Matthias? Let's zoom in on this guy's face, bro. Let's zoom in on Matthias, bro. Matthias look like he want revenge. Look at his picture. Maybe I might be too critical, but Matthias... Let's see what he says about Matthias. I'm thinking Matthias is the strange one out of the five. Matthias might have done something strange for a little piece of change. Who knows? Let's find out, man. This is this, this not adding up, bro. This is not adding up. Emaciated body, spread out hypothermia. Strangely, Gary was never found. Only his shoes were discovered in the nearby woods. To this day, no one can figure out why the group had gone in the direction they did or why they left their perfectly functioning car, which the five men could have easily pushed out from the snow, only to separate from each other, and eventually starve or freeze to death. On top of this, all of their families agreed that it was uncharacteristic of them to not help John Scones push his car out from the snow when he called out for help, and why Ted didn't even attempt to start a fire or the trailer's heating system, or eat the food found in the trailer, still makes no sense at all. Craig Freer of Scotia, New York, was 17 when he was last seen in June of 2004. He was a popular kid, with dimples, red hair, and a welcoming smile as he was described by friends and family. He was a star soccer player at the Scotia Glenville High School and about to be named captain of his team. Craig also picked up a part-time job, and his future was looking bright. There were a few colleges interested in offering Craig a scholarship for his athletic abilities. Okay, and one could okay, say okay, the world okay. was truly his oyster. Aha. But that all changed on June 27, 2004. Mm -hmm. On that day, he walked into the woods and was never seen again. So rewind- Goodness gracious, he walked into the woods and was never seen again. Man, listen, man. This is, this, this is just confirming me more and more about not going to the woods, especially by yourself, especially unarmed, you know what I mean? Like, what's up, what's, bro? There are some weird creatures or some weird things happening in the woods. It, it's, it's gotta be. We watch the movies, we see the things. Like, somebody knows something that we don't know. 
for sure. That like somebody knows something that's not public. Cause because why is is the wood so mysterious, bro? What is in there? What's there? How come we have not seen those creatures, bro? I think something is I think something weird is there. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> that came up on me quickly. But I think something's in the woods. Something strange, weird creatures, or weird weird, weird people that hunt people. Or something, bro. Cause people are are disappearing for a reason. It's no like you just don't like evaporate because you you, you know you go to the woods. You, something's happening. Do I really want to know what's happening? I don't know if I want to know that either. But I'm just saying, I believe something strange is happening more than we know. Winding a bit, when Craig picked up his job at the Price Chopper Supermarket in Glenville, New York, his parents were proud that he'd be fitting working in with his busy schedule. On the dreaded day of Craig's disappearance, he was seen by his parents walking out of his home for what would be the last time. His parents were under the impression he was going to work. His mother Veronica had even seen him carrying his uniform with him to his car. But when she went to go shopping at the supermarket later where Craig worked, just a few hours after he left home for his shift, she was confused when there was no trace of him. Veronica learned that Craig had actually lost his job at the supermarket after two months of employment and had been hiding it from his parents. He had been pretending to work there for weeks after his termination so that his parents wouldn't know he was no longer employed. Wow. It's unknown why he was fired though, likely for not showing up. Very upset with their son, Craig's parents called his girlfriends since he left his phone behind. They did not yet know that she was his ex-girlfriend. They called her to see if they knew where he was, and at first she said she had no idea, but after a second call, out of guilt, she admitted that he was with her. Veronica lectured Craig over the phone, telling him that he needed to come home right away and that they needed to talk to him. Little did they know he was visiting her because he was upset about their recent breakup. Craig said goodbye to his ex-girlfriend and left her apartment located in Scotia as well, and according to his ex-girlfriend, she watched as he walked towards his car, but then stood still for a moment then darted off in the opposite direction, as if something had scared him and he was running away from imminent danger. However, if that were the case, it would have made more sense to drive away. Before this, he told his mother he would be home in 10 minutes over the phone, the time it would take to drive from his ex-girlfriend's to home. Around the time that call ended, Craig's dad arrived at the complex and saw his son's car was still parked outside. By 5 p.m. that day, Veronica had reported her son missing, and at first police weren't too interested, assuming it was just a normal kid running away for the day because of an argument with parents. But as hours turned into days, and when the investigators found out that he didn't have his phone or wallet with him at the time of his disappearance, they agreed something was wrong and began to further investigate. Police hit a big lead when a few teenagers came forward to tell police that they had seen Craig or someone matching his description walking along the railroad tracks behind his ex-girlfriend's apartment complex. Don't tell me he committed suicide. Oh, I got something in my beard. <clears throat> Don't tell me he committed suicide, baby. Now that that is that's not gonna be. Uh, I, I don't tell me he did that. Plex, and shortly after he was seen entering the woods, they claimed that when they tried to call to him, he motioned for them to be quiet with his finger to his lips, what and the then just heck? kept on walking, disappearing into the woods. Investigators started searching up and down the railway line with no luck. Police dogs were used while searching the woods, even checking the nearby Mohawk River. But all these searches turned up nothing, as if Craig had just vanished into thin air. Of course, after two decades, police investigations have largely scaled back. But in 2021, a new lead was discovered. One of Craig's co-workers at the Price Chopper supermarket told investigators that sometime between June 27th and June 2nd, 2004, he saw Craig in the passenger seat of a car, traveling north on Route 50 in Glenville. According to the witness, the car stopped at the traffic lights on Sheffield Road before turning left and disappearing up the intersecting road. Craig's family is still hoping that one day they'll learn the truth about what happened to their son. The For a well-liked 17-year-old with such a bright future, no one can seem to understand how or why he just vanished into the woods. Craig is on net. And one of the creepiest national park disappearances I've ever heard. In March of 2014, Two Dutch young women, Chris Kremers and Lee San Froon, went to Panama for a vacation to reward themselves for graduating. To make it a little more upsetting, the two had taken on extra shifts the month prior in order to pay for it. Reaching Panama, they soon headed for the town of Bouquet, where they were hosted by a family. Shortly after, on April 1st, 2014, 
Chris and Lee San vanished as they were hiking the trails in the forest around the town of Bouquet, which in of itself was strange because they were scheduled for a tour guide by the name of Feliciano to assist them on the trails for the following day. Well, well, I might have to rethink vacational uh, tours, you know. <clears throat> I might have to rethink that because I'm planning on going on a vacation tour or, uh, or a vacation excursion. What am I saying? I'm planning to do something similar, basically, like go on a... Like a vacation on the island, and you know how they do like the explore the area, and then you you know go into. I might not do that. I'm might, I'm I'm gonna read. I'm gonna I'm gonna take some notes and do some more research, cause that might not be a good idea. I don't know what's out there either. Am I acting scary? I probably am acting scary, but it's making me think. You know what I mean? It's making me have a third thought about this excursion in the future. But for now. I might put that on hold. <laughs> I might put that. The two women made their way for the trails, accompanied by the host family's dog named Blue. When Blue arrived back home later that evening without the girls, the family became concerned and tried contacting the mother of Lee San, who then proceeded to try to make contact with her daughter, but to no avail. On April 2nd, the following day, Feliciano was waiting for the girls to show up for their hike, but they never arrived. La persona que por un evento que teníamos pendiente de hacer, eh... First of all, how is he gonna? Who's gonna be their translator, bro? Where is the translator for this guy, bro? Is this was this really? I don't even think that. I don't think this was a good idea anyway. Who is gonna help translate and understand what this guy is saying, bro? Because I don't. Is this? Well, is this Dutch? Hold on. No, that's Spanish for sure. Um, <laughs> like, I don't even know how they're gonna do this little thing with this guy because if they don't have a translator, how do how do they know what he's saying? Because I don't think he speaks English. I I don't think he does. He probably does, but he doesn't look like he does. He did, and he doesn't sound like it. But I don't know. I don't know how this will work. And they probably knew it wasn't gonna work, so they probably just uh, tried to go. They probably figured it out, oh, you know what, he doesn't speak English, let's just go early and let's be done, tell him we're canceling. And he probably just went and got into some danger. He went to the home of the host family the girls were staying at, but they weren't there as well. In fact, most of the women's belongings were still there prior to their disappearances. The women did have their cell phones, but they wouldn't answer any attempted calls. As panic began to set in with everyone, the police were contacted and an extensive search began, with the help of everyone from farmers and locals, to detectives, search dogs, helicopters, and more. The search lasted for 10 days, yet no trace of Chris and Lee San were found. Two months had passed and a local found a backpack belonging to one of the women. To everyone's shock and horror, skeletal remains were also discovered, and after DNA testing, they were shown to be matches for both women. The story doesn't end there though. While continuing the investigation, their cell phone logs were released. The two women were trying to make 911 phone calls throughout the stretch of the 10 days, but they couldn't get service. Although believed to be a possible accident of getting lost and injured in the forest, which therefore resulted in succumbing to the elements, strange discoveries were made that brought that theory into question. Inside one of the backpacks, there was a camera with a hundred photos stored on the memory, taken within those ten days of their vanishing. Oh, shoot. Most of these photos were normal, scenic pictures documenting what was supposed to be the two young women's fun vacation. The police were also able to take the pictures that the women took and match them up with their phone calls to 911. Disturbingly, cell phone data shows that only two hours after this seemingly happy photo was taken, they attempted to call 911. It starts to become stranger though. 10 out of the 100 pictures were taken within the 10 days. The other 90 were taken afterwards around 1 to 4 in the morning, in complete darkness. It may be that they were taken to get some form of vision at night through the flesh, but it's not been confirmed. Some believe that it wasn't even the girls that took these pictures. In one photo of a close-up of the back of Chris's head, it seems to show a wound to the right side in the temple area and blood on her hair. Lisanne may have been using the camera light to see how bad Chris's injury was, some people believe Chris was actually deceased in this photo, and that their murderer was the one taking the photo. Disturbingly, there was a hiking shoe that still had a foot in it that belonged to Chris. Oh, 
Also found was a pelvic bone that belonged to Lee San. As of right now, the accepted theory by police is that the two women went off the beaten path of the trail, and one of them was injured. Then the other woman was trying to provide help and became injured herself in the process, which then led to starvation and dehydration. But this is just a theory, and whether this is true, or if the two girls were targeted by someone out in the woods, will potentially forever remain unknown. But wait, what if the tour guide had something to do with it? A lot of people believe Feliciano had something to do with their deaths. In fact, multiple women have left reviews on the tour guide warning women not to go into the woods alone with him as he can become very touchy flirty. Oh shoot, hold on. Por qué? Por qué aquí? What? Hey, listen man. <laughs> hey, that's what I'm saying. Like why why would he be the tour guide if he doesn't speak English? You know who's their tra who's Translating what he's saying, bro. He's probably like saying, he, like he probably might be saying some freaky stuff. They have no idea because he's speaking Spanish. Who is chat? This is a terrible idea to go with this guy. I said that off rip, and and now now they're saying that he's been known to be touching. Let's read this real quick. Let's read the paragraphs since we got it right here. I strongly recommend women to not hire. <laughs> it's not funny, but. But it's, it's a little bit funny uh, to not hire Feliciano as your guy if you're by yourself. Okay, first of all, yeah, don't go by yourself. We, nobody should go by themselves on a tour or 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 on a tour with a tour guy. You got to have multiple bodies with you. You got to have multiple people that you trust with you if you're going on a tour, especially on an excursion like this. You got to stay uh, safe. You got to be smart. Um, it's a big contrast. It's a it's a big contrast if you look at the. Hold on, did I read the other part? If you're by yourself, it's a big con contrast if you if you look at the other reviews where Felicio is described as a very nice person, which he probably is for many people. I have to say he's very charming, very uh, funny, and you can probably, as you will read in the other reviews, have a great day with him did a walking tour with him he's the guy that knows the area by heart <clears throat> okay he knows the area by heart not long after we left the uh he he suddenly started to flirt with me and also touching me oh freak Ugh. felicio goodness um first my hand but also my arms Shoulders and legs. He getting to the thighs? Felicia is getting to the thigh meat. Oh, Lordy. Now, I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious to how he did it. Because, you know, with the accent and the and, and, and the other language. Pura mami. Mira mami, let me touch you. I don't know. I'm just, I'm messing around too much. Let's continue. Um, even after telling him many times. Dang. He don't listen. Even after telling him many times to stop doing that. He wears a big, he, he, wait, okay, I want more information on that one. Give me more information. Why are you skipping to a whole nother scene? He, he wears a big, but he wears a big machete. Okay. And suggest to chop off my legs. Whoa. Hold on. Hold on, bro. Let me read that again. I might have not read that right. He wears a big machete. And suggest to chop off my legs. Am I? Let me read it slow. I might read it differently. He wears a big machete and suggested to chop off my legs. Wowzers. This is what he be doing? This, of course, was a joke, but still, okay. Okay, so he jokingly said it. Okay. Whew. Let's calm down. But. He has an obsession for Northern European women and felt very, and I felt very unsafe. It's a personal story, but Google his name and you will unfortunately find more stories like this about him. Dang, I'm curious. Should we do a Google search on Felicio, the travel guide? Man, let's do a Google search, guys. <clears throat> Felicio, the travel guide. We got to see this guy because I'm curious about him. <clears throat> I don't know if this guy... How do you spell his name again? We gotta go back. Where's the story at? Uh, Felicio. 
Okay, F E L F E L Felicio. Feliciano. Shoot, Feliciano. Where's the uh where's the reviews? <clears throat> All right, 2018. All right, so we're here, man. This is kind of crazy. It's kind of crazy. Um, it says solo. Okay, it took me almost a year to finally post this review. I strongly recommend women to not hire Felicia. You. Okay, so that's the one we read. Oh shoot, what happened? Okay, truly amazing. That that's a good one. Had a great day with Felicio. See, see, we see. Okay, so obviously, if you go with along with Felicio, he might try to get you. Couples, we contact Felicio. Okay, we need to find the bad ones, bro. Where the bad ones at? Okay, this is all the good ones, man. Where the bad ones at, bro? We looking for the bad ones, man. Oh shoot, what's going on? All right, it's only one bad review. Even allegedly joking with one girl that he chop her leg off. On top of this, Feliciano was the one to find the shoe with a foot in it, behind a specific tree trunk, almost as if he knew to look there. There are a lot more details that go into this theory, but that would remain a video for a different day. For now, whether the tour guide had any part in their disappearance may forever remain a mystery, just like the rest of this case.